All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us from Eliori Weekend. My name is Dave DiLoretto. I'm the chair of ophthalmology and the director of the Flom Eye Institute. And I'd like to take this time to share with you a story of neural retinal transplantation that actually started here at the University of Rochester and kind of what research we're doing today and, and where the field is going. Um, this all started, my experience started in 1989 when I came here as a medical student not knowing much about ophthalmology and not really sure where the retina was itself. But my, my first summer job between the first and the second year of medical school, I was welcomed to the laboratory of Manuel Del Cerro and his wife, Coca Del Cerro, where they were studying retinal transplantation. And um, this story dates back to 1959, where the first uh, retinal trans neural retinal transplant was performed by a group called Royal and Quay. And I'm showing here a cartoon of the eye so everybody's on the same page. This little black ball represents this white mass here that sits in the anterior chamber, which is between the cornea and the lens here in the very front part of the eye. And that was the first type of transplant that was ever performed in a, in a rat model um, from a, fetus, a fetal retina into a, a, an adult rat. This is also a study that we performed, and Dr. Branch might be interested in this. This was back in the 90s, we were trying to find a model to study CMV retinitis. So we would put a human retina in an immunosuppressed rat and then grow CMV in that model. And then we could also test various drugs against um, the effectiveness of treating CMV retinitis. But the real therapeutic um, use of retinal transplantation first came when we were able to put it in the subretinal space or beneath the retina. This is the area that's damaged by many diseases like macular degeneration and retinitis pig pigmentosa, some of the most blinding diseases in the world. And the Del Cerro Laboratory, uh, before I got there, was the first group to do it. Uh, this was followed up by Turner and Blair, who then performed it in a model of retinal degeneration, showing that it could be used um, to study this um, disease. Um, and it really, I was lucky enough to be in the last half of this kind of golden era, era of basic science research and retinal transplantation um, when I did my PhD from 91 to 95 in Del Cerro's laboratory. There were many leaders in the field at that time. It was very popular at several conferences. The donor tissue at that time that we used was fetal retina. There were no stem cells available at that time. And we were transplanting dissociated cells and sheets of retina into models of, of photoreceptor loss in, in several animal models. Um, we were able to show functional testing, survivability of the grass that the, the animals could actually see after we transplanted them, both through um, um, functional testing as well as electrophysiology. And then the, the kind of the, the, the cherry on the top was kind of the work where various groups, including ours, performed this in primates, showing that this could be done and survive, and possibly even we could do this in humans. So uh, we collaborated with a group at Johns Hopkins Hospital and the Wilmer Eye Institute, and pictured here are Gene Dewan and Mark Hamayan, who was Gene's fellow at the time. Um, and we were the group that was able to isolate the fetal tissue. Uh, we created a storage mesh, a method to um, carry it for up to 48 hours so we could transport it from Rochester down to Baltimore, and then these surgeons could transplant the tissue. And the first um, neural retinal transplant was done in a patient with age-related macular degeneration at Johns Hopkins Hospital on January 18, 1995. This was followed by several other transplants in, in other diseases like retinitis pigmentosa. We also collaborated with a group um, at the LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad, India. Um, where we performed numerous uh, 14 transplants into all, these were all patients with retinitis pigmentosa at the time. And the LV Prasad group was actually the first group to publish on this work in humans. And what we learned from both studies, the Hopkins study and the LV Prasad Eye Institute study, that, that this definitely was a feasible model, that, it, that, that cells would survive, but we didn't have a very great outcome. The patients, while they weren't losing vision, um, they weren't really gaining much vision for a sustained amount of time. Other groups um, were working on this. A big group was Ratke's group, um, who published on this at the time as well, all the way up through about um, the early 2000s. And then really nothing was reported since then. And there's a variety of reasons for that. 
there were a lot of barriers to progression at that time. One was that we just had very limited knowledge of the ocular genetics at that time, and, and genetics in general, um, compared to what we know today. So the graft versus host reaction was very strong. We weren't sure how the, the cells were connecting um, with the host. We would transplant the cells, and a lot of times they, they would connect to themselves rather than connect to the host retina. Um, we weren't able to, to monitor those graphs in vivo. Uh, we weren't covering a very big area of those graphs, so we weren't sure really how much vision we could restore even if those graphs survived. And then the other technology, there, there's a retinal chip that came out at the time we were able to place on top of the retina, and this had some promise for a short time, and the cellular research kind of decreased a little bit. And then finally, of course, there was bans on fetal tissue use from the federal and state government level, so, and, and, and stem cell um, weren't available at that time. So everything was kind of put on hold from the mid-2000s. And then the dis discovery, um, the work on stem cells from 1998 to 2014 really ushered in the era of stem cell transplantation for neural retinal tissue um, in, in our model. It was the work, um, first again, the human embryonic stem cell work in 1998. Uh, we're currently partnering with uh, David Gam's laboratory here. He supplies the cells currently for our retinal transplant work that I'm gonna show you shortly. And the first study that was performed with retinal stem cells, it wasn't neural retinal tissue, but it was retinal pigment epithelium. It was performed in Japan um, in, in an industry-sponsored group. They only performed one transplant, um, and then they found when they were evaluating their cells some um, ver uh, mutants and variations in those stem cells um, that they hadn't found previously, so that research was put on hold and really never reported on. There were a lot, you're not meant to read this study, this is just, uh, read this slide, it's just meant to show the amount, the amount of stem cell studies that are planned and reported on clinical trials, um, gov, um, which is a website where you can see all current clinical trials. These aren't necessarily government-sponsored trials, but all trials in general, and in fact, most stem cell trials that came out were industry-sponsored and sponsored by venture capitalism and you can see on the far right, all of this says none. These, none of these results are reported. A lot of these studies started, the results weren't good, they didn't want to disappoint the investors, and we just never got the data from these studies. The two R's here, the work was supposed to come out this year, it's been talked about and talked about and talked about, and the, and the, and the data has still not been released. And so it's been a big problem in our field. So one thing the NIH did in conjunction with the National Eye Institute was create a founding me uh, funding mechanisms to sponsor research in this field. Okay, so this is called the Audacious Goals Initiative, where they, they, would, they would hand out very large grants in the seven to $10 million range and have consortium study neurodegeneration and restoring neurodegeneration. In our case, it's restoring vision. We were lucky enough to hold two of these grants. The first one was first held here by Dr. David Williams, from 2016 to 2021, and then Juliet McGregor, who's the current researcher PI on this program that I work with, um, has hold, held, holds this grant from 21 to 26. And again, we're looking at photoreceptor cell replacement in vivo and using her special imaging model to track these cells and the development of these cells um, in the living animal. Um, so the one thing we have here in Rochester that very few other places have is an imaging system called adaptive optics. And what adaptive optics does to an imaging system, it, it takes away aberrations that decrease the resolution of a photograph. So in a normal um, color photograph, you take pictures, but there's aberrations um, from the cornea, from the lens, from other things that cause aberrant waves. And so you, you can't get a clear picture only to a certain level. But if you have a sensor that senses these direction of these waves, and then it talks to a mirror that can cancel out those waves, and then it creates resolution at a, at a, at a level you just can't imagine. So I have a picture here showing, there's the iris, the pupil, and we're going inside the eye. And this is what it looks like in clinic when I look inside a patient's eye and look at their retina. This is the center of the vision, that's the optic nerve. And this is what, if we try to go in and zoom in to see a cell within the retina, we just can't see it with our current resolution of the modalities we have. 
However, if we apply that adaptive optics imaging system to this camera, all of a sudden we can see everything at a cellular level. The big white circles are the cones in the retina and the small white circles are the rods in the retina. So it's a very powerful tool to, to, to image individual cells within living tissue. The model that we use, we have to create a model um, that mimics human disease. And a lot of these human diseases, they lose their photoreceptors like in retinitis pigmentosa or in age-related macular degeneration, but there's not really a primate model that, that mimics that. And we wanted a primate model so we could use that because it's the closest to human nature and we believe if we could show success in this model, then we, it would be prime for human trials. So this is a picture of a retina that's been lasered, and these are little tiny dots where the laser burns take place. It's a femtosec laser, a very, very focused laser that's able to burn a very small area of the eye. So this is a picture that we take clinically. It's called an OCT. It's a scan of your retina. This little dip is the very center of your vision. And then this is where the ablation of the retina took place, where one of these little spots looks like where this, white, this thick white line is, are your photoreceptors. You can see how they're missing in the back part of the eye there. And that's an adaptive optics image of this picture showing the loss of photoreceptors and then all these white dots around them are photoreceptors surrounding that burn area. So now we have the rest of the cells that all are still intact. They still run their signal up to the brain and we can transplant cells into this area and see if they can connect there and recreate vision in the area that's been lost. Again, David Gamm is our, is our cell guy. He's the one that's making these stem cells, developing them to the critical point um, where they develop to a point where they want to integrate the most into the host retina up to a certain stage. And he's been supplying these cells for the last uh, eight years for us. He's a phenomenal worker, uh, researcher at uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Our surgical setup here at the University of Rochester um, in the animal laboratory, it just looks, looks like a human OR with a regular microscope we would use in human research and all the equipment and machines we would use. So it mimics exactly what we would do in the real world. This is an example of how we start all our transplant techniques. And this is myself and my co-surgeon, uh, Dr. Gulapalli. Um, here you see the uh, back of the retina, there's the optic nerve down here. And I'm taking a 41 gauge needle filled with saline and injecting that underneath the nerve tissue, the, the retina, and creating a bleb or a pocket so that next we can go in there and inject the cells in that subretinal space. And you can see that, um, once again, you can see the laser burns down here, the center of the vision's there, we engage the retina, and then the burst of fluid pierces the retina and expands that bubble and creates a pocket for us to transplant into. Um, so I'm, next I'm going to show you um, the next step of the procedure after the bleb is created, we're going to inject cells into that bleb. This is a setup of what it looks like when we're looking through the microscope into the back of the eye. Um, we have a light pipe that gives us a view. Um, there's a line here with saline that keeps the eye infused and then our instrument that we use to inject the cells into the eye. So you can see there's a bleb here. There's already a few cells in there, that white mass, and you'll see a little burst right there uh, where some more dissociated cells come into that subretinal space and fill that bleb that we had performed um, earlier. Um, and this is one example of what it looks like clinically. Again, this is a living animal. Those cells that we use, we stain them with a fluorescent dye so we can pick, um, take pictures of them and they'll show up um, with this fluorescence in the pictures we take afterwards. So these are two little clumps that we've transplanted underneath the retina. You can see the scan, these little bumps and lumps here are the transplanted cells underneath that, that nerve tissue. And this is at two weeks and at three months post-transplantation. Now, one thing we did to try to increase the area and make a more consistent area that we're transplanting in is to use a a vehicle, a scaffold, um, to seed this with 
the stem cells. So this scaffold is about a two by four millimeter piece of plastic that's biodegradable. On um, electron microscopy imaging, you can see these tiny little hexagonal wells that are filled there. And we seed that entire plate with uh, photoreceptor cells. And then we we're able to load that once it's seeded with cells into this instrument um, that sucks the scaffold into it. And then during our surgery, we're gonna, now I'll show you a video, we're gonna create a bleb and then eject that scaffold out under the retina into the bleb. And when we seed, and when we seed the cells and then use fluorescence to see where they're labeled, this is what it would look like. Um, these are the cells we're transplanting within each of these wells here. So the next video here is a little bit longer. It's gonna show the setup. Again, you're gonna see the blood formation here. You can see some laser marks in the background. We're gonna create a little saline blood first. This one's gonna be a little bit larger because we have to fit that scaffold into it. And then you can see it expanding across the back of the eye. And then because that instrument that we use to inject the scaffold is very large, we have to create a large incision for, for eye surgeons, it's a large incision, Dave, okay? <laughs> <laughs> on the outside, it's only about two and a half millimeters um, on the outside. So first it's a partial thickness, and then we use a laser to cauterize that before we enter into the eye. Next, uh, we use a, a instrument to cauterize part of the bleb because we're going to have to need to cut that to create a site for that scaffold to inject into. So these are a pair of vertical scissors we're using and just going to cut through the area that we've cauterized so there's no bleeding. And that's the space that's going to receive the scaffold. Now we'll finish the scrotomy full thickness. And there's the tip of that instrument. If you watch this blue line at the very back part of the scaffold, you'll see that advancing slowly, slowly, slowly into that blub. And if it's done correctly, <laughs> this is what it should look like. So this isn't a live animal. That's the scaffold underneath the retina. This, this cross section here represents this picture. And you can see the scaffold between the two blue lines underneath the retina. The white dots that are highlighted <laughs> here is this picture with in, using fluorescence imaging, highlighting the cells that are in the scaffold. And that's the, using adaptive optics at a very high power of view to see the cells um, on the well uh, that's under the retina. The big question, of course, is how do the cells integrate? Um, so, the top panel is a series of photographs, fluorescent photographs of the transplanted cells when we injected the cell suspension. And the bottom panel is a scaffold example. But what you can see here with these two pictures as, the, um, as time progresses, eventually you see these little outsprouting of little tails from these cells, which are neuride extensions from the cells. I believe we, those are the things that will eventually be connecting to the host. And the same thing down here, you can see these little tails extending from these graphs here. And again, this is live imaging of an animal with our adaptive optic system. It looks just like looking through, through a microscope. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And then finally, um, we use special staining um, after the animal is sacrificed. You can see the, the purple here is the scaffold. The golden labeled cells are the transplanted cells. The green labeled cells are the host cells. And here's a uh, blown up image of one cell, the transplanted cell with the host cell. And these little pink dyed areas are what we call ribbon synapses. Those are, we believe, represent functional connectivity between two neuronal types of cells. So you have a neuron in the host cell, which is green, a neuron from the transplanted cell, which is yellow, and then the ribbon synapses this represents functional connectivity of the two, two cell types. Um, there's a lot more to be done in this work. Of course, we want to show the electrophysiology and the functional connectivity of these graphs so that they actually give functional vision to um, the patient. 
Um, we also are working on a method to get rid of the scaffold and use completely biologic materials to create this complex that we grow in addition, then um, kind of inject it into the subretinal space. And if all that goes right over the next few years, hopefully we'll start uh, clinical trials in the next five years or so. Um, this work was done by a lot of people. I, I was lucky enough to be just the hands on this project, but um, Juliet McGregor is the PI of the consortium. She's here at the University of Rochester. Teresa Protessor is at Berkeley, and David Gamigan is at Wisconsin. They're the other main PIs on the project. And we have a whole team here that helps us with all this, the University of Rochester. Uh, and this work is sponsored by the NIH and the NEI, as I said, the Audacious Goals Initiative, Research to Prevent Blindness. Steve Feldman Scholarship sponsors Dr. Juliet McGregor's work, and ARIA, um, which is a part of the Center for Visual Science. Thank you very much.